And welcome to our Just the Facts interview this week with Michaela S. Cox. She holds a master's degree in political science and is a prolific author with her series on We the People. Uh, she's also been published four times in the International Journal of Social Science Studies. And I'm not going to say more about her because my very first question for you is, tell us a little bit about your background. You've had a pretty wild background, haven't you? Yes, I have. Um, do you mean, uh, uh, excuse me, um, per personally or professionally, like how I got into my love of political science? How about both? All right, political science. I was raised with a mom, a lover, but she watched C-SPAN. So, and she watched Capital Gang and she watched Crossfire and <laughs> summer of 87 when I was like, between second and third grade, we couldn't leave the house until she watched the Iran Contra Oliver North uh, hearings on C-SPAN. I'm like, oh my God, I was like eight. So I was like, can we just leave already? I didn't get how important it was at the time. So I grew up around it in the sense of my mom's passion for it. And I was a weird kid. I wrote my first editorial in second grade about uh, how I thought it was wrong to burn the American flag. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what kid in second grade writes an editorial and never mind on politics. So um, I've always kind of been around it. I've always thought it was important. Um, I played with the idea of doing something with an undergraduate and I ran out of time. So I thought, well, since I couldn't do an undergraduate, I'll do my master's in it. So that's how I kind of got to the road of, you know, our government and all that jazz. Um, as far as personally, um, I call it my 38 triple D a journey of learning how to go from much tribulation to thriving in all things, a lifelong disability of legal blindness, divorce at 26. And then when I was 38, four years ago, I lost my husband, love of my life. And I am now a widow and solo mom and a writer and speaker. Wow. What a, what a situation. I understand you're, you're originally from Texas. Yes. And that's what I claim. <laughs> okay. But you presently are in Louisiana. Yes, I am. And I understand you're dealing with some weather there, but uh, hopefully it's going to turn out okay for you. And uh, uh, we're going to move this along as quickly as we can so that if we do get interrupted by a power shortage, we'll still have some usable material. And uh, tell our audience about your, your, your book series, We the People. What was the inspiration for it? And tell us a little bit about it. That's great. Oh, it's turning around. Sorry. Um, I have... I mean, I will admit I, I'm actually registered as Republican, but I'm more conservative than anything. And above all else, I'm a constitutionist first and foremost, and I'm conservative, but in the political parties have actually been ruffling my feathers for a long time. But what I would like people to understand is, and I think the importance of it, whether you are Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, whatever, middle of the road, moderate, independent, Green Party, I don't really care. We, as members of we the people individually, but together collectively as a nation, because it is made up of individuals who come together as a nation to represent we the people as a whole, have to understand whether you agree with them or don't. But it's like football or soccer or baseball or basketball. You're not getting on that field or that court and be able to play the game well if you don't understand the rules and respect the rules. We have to understand the rules of our country if we want to be able to keep our country and understand what it is we're exactly supposed to be defending, protecting, and preserving. If we don't know what we got, we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. And so my goal is to at least inform people of the rules and understand the value, the importance, the profound, immense, paramount importance of we the people, that is the whole point of our country. If you don't get that, you don't get America, which is why, <clears throat> excuse me, that is not only in the beginning of our constitution, it is the first three words of our constitution. It is in those words that sums up America. There's a lot more to it than those three words, but those three words say it all. And I wanted in this book to explain and impress upon people and educate people and empower people to understand the meaning of, the value of, the place of, the role of, and the importance of we the people. Because you have to start there if you want to understand America. I'm not asking you to agree. I'm not asking you to be in support of it in the sense of you may want to go change the rules, fine. 
but you have to understand the rules first before you can figure out what you're going to do and be able to play well in this country, or at least the way that this country should work. <laughs> and tell us about, uh, so how many books are in the series? This is the first one, and I've already outlined the second one that I will have come out in 2022, which will take a person, a reader, part by part, part of the Constitution, and I'm playing with the title right now, and then that's what I'm working on for that series. Okay, and it is available on Amazon. This one is correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. In paperback yeah. and an ebook. Very good. Excellent. And um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what in, inspired you to do this. Obviously, I mean, you have a, you 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 know, from your mom, you got this uh, rather incredible introduction into um, uh, political life. Uh, the Iran Contra hearing, some of these things sound like, um, uh, you know, watching paint dry, but uh, there were some very important pieces in the things that you mentioned. And uh, the eight year old at the time, it was paint drying, but not so much. as the <laughs> adult. I, I can appreciate why she did what she did. But at eight, you're like, oh, my God, I just want to go play, you know, and then she watched, of course, you know, Clarence Thomas being, you know, um, confirmed and then you know in my adult life I watched Kavanaugh be confirmed and I watched the impeachment hearings which in my opinion were total bullcrap but whatever that's <laughs> I'm trying to remain unbiased but this is my soapbox yeah well it, it, we we've all experienced um an awful lot of nonsense uh out of Washington and uh, yeah. it's uh, uh, you know it's interesting because uh uh, you know, understand that there's, uh, you know, a challenge to one of our most fundamental institutions, the Supreme Court, uh, with this current administration. And yet, I don't hear any big public drive to change the Supreme Court. And it, it does, and, and it's interesting, because I heard one of the possible proposals is to implement term limits. And I can tell you that speaking as a constitutionalist, and as a very fundamental person, I would have liked to have seen Ruth Bader Ginsburg out of there a long time ago. No know. kidding. Oh my, <laughs> so, oh my gosh, so I cannot. <laughs> oh, she aggravated the dickens out of me. I'm like, whatever. But understanding the constitution also tells us that the reason that we didn't put term limits in was kind right. of interesting because the founding fathers had a fundamental concern that they wanted the federal court system to be independent of politics. And right. as you said, doesn't matter, you know, Republican, Democrat, Green Party, we, we're all joined together in, in this um, incredible experiment. So it's, 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 it's pretty interesting, uh, you know, the way this thing has developed. Um, one of the things that I, that I know that you address is this whole issue of what we call wokeism. And I wonder what you, you see as, uh, as the cure for that, if you will, or, or how you see the United States recovering from the current uh, debacle and the CRT stuff and all that. Quite honestly, we're gonna have to have a change of leadership. My prayer is right now we can make it another 18 months till we get the midterm elections, but that's neither here or there. Um, as far as where we're at, I, I do think on something you were saying a second ago, we as much as term limits may be good, but because of the court, I don't know if constitutionally that's the best idea. But the reason why people aren't saying anything about it is, is because I think in our society, a lot of people don't truly get how important each piece is. And if you, so they don't pay it any attention, so they don't think anything about it. So it's not a big deal to them when really all of it's a big deal and it would make major difference one way or the other depending on how it would be altered and this idea that they were talking about around the election of a packed court oops, sorry big thunder there um packed court that's not a new idea the people who are in favor of that have been tossing that idea idea around since fdr it's nothing new under this political sun do i agree with it no but that wasn't a shocker that's like when they can't get what they want, that's the, the card for the court they always play. It's it's not a new idea in our, our country. So for everyone who is all whatever about it, I'm like, go read a history book. That's been around forever. They're just trying to find a way to get around the legitimate way of doing things in this country, and then they're going to make it what they want or take their political toys and go home. Um, 
as far as what's going on in our country, I don't think we're headed in the right direction anymore, but that's my opinion. And we're going to have to have a change of leadership and priorities if we want to fix it, in my opinion, but that's up to we the people. Yeah, so I'll be kind of interested. You know, a, a quick final question. I wanted to ask you, you are in an interesting state. Texas, of course, has uh, been a, a fairly conservative state for, you know, I guess right about 30 years now. And then uh, Louisiana is a state that has elected a Republican governor, but has usually had Democrat governors. Uh, Our Orleans, current governor is Democrat right now. Right, but New Orleans is, is, is a city famously right. you know, out on the, you know, the liberal side. And yes. I, I, don't, I don't know a lot about Baton Rouge, but of course, many of us read uh, All the King's Men about Huey Long. And, uh, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's best. pretty it's pretty interesting, and and of course you have a a, a, a Republican senator who is uh, in the news uh, quite a bit, you know, especially on Fox and uh, uh, Newsmax. So um, it, it sounds like you have quite a melting pot there in the state of Louisiana. Well, what people don't really realize about Louisiana is because when you hear Louisiana, you think New Orleans, you think Cajun, you think Kunas, you think you know, Lafayette, you know, you think below, you know, like that Acadian, very French Creole culture or whatever, which Louisiana in a, is kind of a weird mixture. It's like you get below a certain point and you do have that Southern culture, South Louisiana culture, everyone thinks about, but above that line in the state, the rest of the state's not really like that. It's very, I would say more bland and more traditional and more kind of conservative and you know, more Southern Baptist as opposed to Catholic, not saying there's anything wrong with Catholic, it's just the demographics of the state or yeah. other Protestant um, religions, you know, denominations. So it's very, you have half of a state that's one way and then you have the bottom half, which is totally opposite direction. And a lot of people don't realize that. So it's kind of an interesting mix to play with. And Louisiana and Texas in and of themselves are not alone in this. You have the East Coast and the West Coast who tend to be more liberal. You have middle America who's either moderate or conservative. But what a lot of people don't realize is when you have a state that may be small but are pulled a certain direction, you're not that Texas is really that small. You're correct. Texas has been conservative for a long time. But what the liberals know is, know to be true, if they can get Austin and turn Texas, they'll have currently, I don't know what the electoral college votes will end up being after the 2020 census, but currently in the 2020 election, Texas had 38 electoral votes. If they can turn that state to liberal, that means they'll get not only probably New York and California, but they'll get another 38 in their column. And that's why they're so desperate for Texas to turn when traditionally and historically Texas has been conservative. And what you find in a lot of these states, you have one huge populous area that's liberal and it taints what the state really is because you see that one big cluster and you think that states that certain political leaning when it's really not. <laughs> well, you make a good point there. And it's been great visiting with you. As you know, we try and keep these short, frankly, so that our audience will watch what we provide. And I, I wanted to uh, tell people that they have a chance to get a lot more information about you from your website, which is myheartfeltmeditations.com. Correct. And um, we'll, um, uh, we're delighted to have you with us today. And I hope you do well with the, the weather outside. I know there's been some pretty bad damage from hurricanes and tornadoes through Louisiana. I hope this is not one of them today. Yeah, me too. And we're back in hurricane season. Like, oh dear God, please not again, not like last year. But I would like to add one thing before we go, because this sure. is something you mentioned and I meant to mention it. I felt like part of the reason why the election went the way it went in 2020 is I felt like, since we talked a lot about the judicial branch, I feel like personally, the judicial branch let this country down and members of we the people down because they for whatever reason i don't know how they think i don't know what the evidence was i don't know what the case was but they i feel like let we the people down and they did not come to the aid of the wishes of we the people and ensure that we the people integrity of their voices were delivered in that election because they chose not to intervene to ensure that there was integrity and the one main way that we the people get to exercise our voice in this country and i felt very disappointed in that and i felt like they let the whole country down 
Well, I certainly agree with you. And I, I'm still bemused about the fact that we saw, we the American people saw video of, of, of bogus ballots being pulled out from a table in the state of Georgia, one of the critical areas in the election. And somehow a judge says that, that wasn't relevant. And right. I'm, I'm still you know, scratching my head over that. So we certainly agree the ones um, okay. that know what's what are all scratching their heads because there was too much evidence, not just in Georgia, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and some of the other major states, I believe it was Michigan and Arizona, and I'm trying to think because it's been a while, another one on that list that should have been action taken, and it was just like, it was dropped. Absolutely. And the lawsuit that several of the states are trying to get together, the, the, the courts refused to take it up, that it was a good, strong faith effort that could have done something and they chose to not acknowledge it and not run with it. Well, I certainly agree with you. Well, this is today's edition of Saving America and we very much appreciate you joining us and I hope people will take a look at your website.